Throughout the history of this little sceptered isle, there's been green fields and meadows littered with corpses and stained with blood. A needless effusion of blood. And in the hovels and houses of the poor, and in the castles and palaces of the great, families have tried to comfort one another at such times, when far too often it was the family that had caused the bloodshed. You might think your family forms a safe haven in times of trouble, but don't rely on it. History is spattered with wicked stepmothers, murderous lovers, and people with the wrong Scottish surname. Shakespeare said it best of all, that even a great king will one day do nothing more than provide a banquet for worms. No matter the porphyried perfection of the marble tomb that marks his grave, his body will ripen and swell in rankness and collapse in fetid corruption, just as certainly as any other man's who carried lesser cares through life. It has to be said that the head that wore the crown would probably have rested uneasily in pretty well any period you happen to have found yourself in. But Dark Age kingship, <laughs> well, that was a distinctly dodgy affair. Hereditary succession, well, it may well lumber you from time to time with a monarch who is quite clearly a haunch of venison short of a banquet, but it does at least have the dubious distinction of preventing rival factions from hacking each other to pieces as they try to carve their way onto a vacant throne. For ordinary, everyday sort of folk like ourselves, the trauma of having rival factions conducting their negotiations in the middle of your field of standing barley was something you could well do without, not least because they had a distressing habit of not bothering to tidy away the bodies afterwards. But the murder and mayhem that contending factions tended to visit on one another in these circumstances did at least have the dubious distinction of taking place out in the open where everybody could see who they were up against and what they were up against. But families, well, they can give you grief at the best of times. But royal families, oh boy, you really have to start watching your back where they're concerned. If young King Edward, back in 978, had bothered to keep a closer eye on his stepmom. Well, who knows? He might have lived long enough to have a family of his own. King Edward was born into an age emerging from turmoil, a turmoil his father Edgar the Peaceable sought to end. He reformed much that stood in need of reform, but sadly for his eldest son, he neglected to reform the morals of his second wife, Elfrida. The, the king of the Saxons up until 975 was King Edgar, Edgar the Peaceable, a fairly popular king. His first wife gave him a son who was called Edward, but for various political reasons, the king farmed out his first wife to uh, some senior position in the church and married Elfrida from the West Country, who then bore him another son called Ethelred. Ethelred's mother, Elfrida didn't, uh, didn't want Edward to become king, although uh, that was the, the normal succession. So Edgar died in, in 975, and the new king was Edward. Unfortunately for Edward, Elfrida bore Edgar a younger son, Edward's stepbrother, Ethelred. King Edward continued his father's policy of enriching and endowing the monasteries, making them more powerful and his nobles less so. It was a policy that alienated the aristocracy and his scheming stepmother was quick to seize the possibilities that offered. She secretly formed alliances with Edward's prominent opponents and she began to plan and plot the assassination of her stepson in order to put her own son on the throne. A murder made so much easier because Edward trusted and was actually fond of the Dowager Queen Mum. Queen Elfrida, I think, was very keen on exercising power. Uh, as the Queen of King Edgar, she had 
got into that position through some some slightly uh, uh, slightly clandestine operations by the king. Um, and when she became the queen, under Edgar's rule, she was certainly very influential and brought him support from significant areas of the country. When the new king, Edward, took over after Edgar's death, she was not able to exercise a great deal of power because she was only the, the stepmother. And uh, I suspect that, um, that she found this a bit of a problem. Removing Edward and becoming the official queen mother of her own son gave her the opportunity once again to exercise significant influence in the court, as was, I think, normal with mothers and wives of, of monarchs at that time. Mothers, eh? Mind you, Elfrida didn't exactly have what you could describe as an overly developed maternal instinct. I mean, come on, most mothers are usually pretty good at remembering that everyone is some mother's son, and so they're generally less likely to set to slaughtering them simply because they've got in the way of their plans. I've often thought the world might be a considerably less bloody, awful place if we had a little bit more oestrogen running through the seats of power rather than male testosterone. But the sad fact is, I suspect that Elfrida was simply one of those cold, calculating witches who'll stop at nothing to get what they want. She wanted more power, and she saw a chance to grab it for herself through a newly crowned and suitably grateful son. Plotting with malice of forethought, Elfrida gave careful consideration to the time and place of execution. Well, it happened on his evening return from hunting the Isle of Purbeck, and that was 18th of March, um, year 978, and location Corf Gate, which is now the inner gatehouse of what we see as Corf Castle. So this is the Saxon, well, originator of um, the Norman Castle, the entrance to his stepmother's Elfrida's Domus, where um, her son Ethelred was living, which of course is the basic problem. The tradition tells how Edward was riding home from a day's hunting, happy, relaxed, utterly unsuspecting. He went alone to the Queen's quarters nearby. As he approached, nobles in attendance on Elfrida came out to greet him. As he leaned out of the saddle to talk, they grabbed his proffered hand and wrenched him from his horse, twisting and breaking his arm in the process. As he began to fall, they'd already begun punching broad-bladed knives up into his abdomen. Edward crashed heavily to the ground, his hip smashing against a stone, his shoulder crunching and grating as he desperately tried to crawl away from the frenzy of knife blows that came carving, curving down on his defenceless body. A while afterwards, the body was recovered and taken to Wareham, where he was given a decent burial. Some years later, the body was removed from Wareham and taken to Shaftesbury with full royal honours, a long procession uh, from Wareham up to Shaftesbury, where he was buried at Shaftesbury Abbey. One interesting bit of the story is that the Queen, on her horse, felt she needed to join the procession taking the king's body to Shaftesbury, uh, but the legend goes that her horse would not move forwards, it would only move backwards, and therefore the guilt um, became attached to her. People could see that, that um, she'd done something wrong, and so she took herself off uh, to a, a sort of nunnery and spent the rest of her days either praying for forgiveness or just hiding away from public gaze. And Ethelred paid a price too. He'd seen his brother brutally cut down by his domineering mother to clear his path to the throne. He grew up riddled by guilt and insecurity, an inept monarch whose kingdom was all but engulfed by the Vikings. Ethelred the unready, the worst of all kings. Well, you know, despite the fact that this is a gruesome and a grisly story, sort of thing Quentin Tarantino would be well proud of, despite the fact that it has a universality that speaks to all of us of the malign and murderous potentiality inherent in the pursuit of power. 
it doesn't have any basis in historical fact. It isn't supported by any archaeological evidence. It's just a story. Or it was, until almost a thousand years after the murder, when the accidental discovery of a, a medieval casket, a lead oshery containing the bones of a skeleton, made us all think again. When those bones were examined in detail, they caused a minor academic sensation. The numerous injuries distinctly visible on the skeleton and their exact correspondence with the chronicler's description of how Edward met his end appeared way beyond the possibilities of mere coincidence. These had to be the remains of Edward the Martyr. The evidence is on the bones that were found in the lead box, Shaftesbury Abbey, that came from the Claridge excavation in 1931. Now, they are definitely the skeleton of a youth, and he most definitely met a violent death. And the beautiful thing about the bones are that they fit all the details of the chronicle account of the assassination of King Edward at Corfe Castle in 978, so it is an amazing coincidence. Well, certainly the, the bone injuries recorded are consistent with somebody falling off a horse. Uh, his left leg was obviously trapped in the stirrup and this resulted in fracture of his thigh bone, the left thigh bone, in two places when it was stretched over the uh, saddle. Then he falls off the horse because the horse bolted away and obviously he's going to fall onto his right side. And when you land on your right side, there are two points of contact. That's one is your shoulder, and the other is your hip. And both showed evidence of fracture. So it's certainly in keeping with somebody falling off a bolting horse. Some of the injuries to his arms are of a twisting type, and that would be very unlikely to happen in a straightforward fall. So I'd certainly agree that uh, there's been some degree of foul play. The, the details in the bones now is strong enough evidence for a post-mortem at an inquest today to bring in a verdict of unlawful killing. A millennium later, it's just amazing. But that's not the end of the story, you know. You won't find Edward's bones in the place where they were originally laid to rest, in Shaftesbury Abbey. Shaftesbury Abbey, where they've built a new shrine to house them, if they should ever get them back. OK, it's not to my taste, but you can't knock the sentiment. No, Edward's bones, Edward's last mortal remains, are in London in a Russian Orthodox church. So in one of those bizarre little accidents that litter the historical landscape, the bones of Edward the Martyr lie in a place utterly unconnected with his short life and tragic death.
the grim stone walls of Barclay Castle were once witness to a murder so appalling as to horrify those who hear the tale retold 700 years later. It was a murder committed by a spurned and humiliated wife who connived with her lover to rid herself of her homosexual husband and place her son on his throne. Her husband was by no stretch of the imagination a saint, but the method they used to send him to his grave had not a touch of Christian compassion and was beyond redemption, not least because their helpless victim was Edward II, King of England. His father, Edward I, was arguably the most ruthlessly determined monarch ever to have sat on our throne. He was incredibly bad news if you were a Scot or a Welshman with uniform notions of nationhood. And he was every bit as bad for a stripling son trying to struggle to manhood in the shadow of a tyrannical father. The early Plantagenets clearly weren't blessed with great imagination in the naming of their offspring, but then Edward I had other qualities to commend him to history. He was a fearless warrior, a forceful and fearsome lawgiver and administrator. No wonder his son was such a deep disappointment to him. Edward II was a disinterested lawmaker and administrator and a disastrously incompetent military commander. Yeah, Edward, poor old Edward II was a real disappointment to his father Edward, who was the first, obviously. Um, I think the biggest one at that time was the fact that uh, he really didn't like girls very much. And although there was quite a bit of it about, it never was talked about that much. But poor young Edward didn't give a damn and would have these favourites in court. And he would shower them with gifts and everything. And one of them was a chap called Piers Galveston, whose dad was a French knight. Um, there's a joke there somewhere, French knight. But he came over to England and um, became the favourite, and one of the, one of the great presents was to make him the Earl of Cornwall. This was a title which had never been conferred on anybody not of the blood royal. It outraged the nobility. But Gaveston didn't help matters. He taunted his enemies at every opportunity. Knowing how they longed to cut him down to size, he organised a special tournament to give them the chance. And he proceeded to trounce every single might that entered the lists against him. This was no limp wristed Liberace, as his enemies quickly discovered. Safe beneath the protective canopy of Edward's love, he continued to goad the nobility. Edward gleefully helped him. He married him to a royal niece with royal revenues. And finally, he created Gaveston Regent, the executive power in the realm when the king was abroad. The belted earls and barons were just a little bit miffed. Look, I don't want you to go thinking that the, the aristocracy were all homophobic. Well, they were, but, you know, not so that they'd want to murder their monarch just because he batted for the other side. No, they didn't actually go out and buy lots of Tom Robinson or Village People CDs, but they were less concerned about the king's sexual preferences than they were about the political consequences of the king's infatuations. You see, they saw themselves as the natural advisors to the king, natural rulers, if truth be told, and they saw themselves being increasingly excluded from the king's councils by a coterie of favourites, a coterie of favourites led by Piers Gaveston. As far as they were concerned, the fact that they were losing their influence and losing the rewards that came from the exercise of that influence that was all down to one man, a jumped up Gascon knight who was keeping them outside the magic circle. Content within that enchantment, Edward happily neglected his kingly duties and the pursuit of pleasure and compromised his kingly dignity, not just because of his blatantly unmistakable orientation, but because he actually enjoyed mixing with the lower orders. In a rigidly hierarchical society, such degrading behavior at the top threatened the whole structure. The nobility's toleration was very limited. Young Edward had really upset all our immediate neighbours, worse than even his father had in Scotland, Ireland and Wales. But they were courting the French and Edward was sent over to marry, I think probably with some protest, the daughter of the King of France, Isabella. Now she was only 12 years old, 
And although uh, there was no, nothing like that went on in those days, it was quite common to marry young girls. So she came back to England, not really knowing what to expect, and I think probably it was quite a saving grace that uh, he turned out uh, to be gay. Those who'd prayed that Edward's marriage might ease the situation were severely disappointed. He continued cloistered and content with his lover, but Gaveston's overarching dominance was about to come crashing down. Obviously, if you've just brought your young wife back uh, to England and you run straight into the arms of your boyfriend, it doesn't look particularly good, either with your fellow nobles or the poor old King of France who just let his little girl go. So the nobles, who were already completely fed up with him over, over the, the, the dreadful state the country was in, he'd, he'd ruined it financially, we were basically at war with all our neighbours, and they thought the way to get him to abdicate for a start was to go and get uh, Gaveston executed, which they promptly did. Gaveston fled from Oxford to Scarborough Castle, where he was captured. But en route to London, he was seized by other nobles at Deddington, who took him to Warwick and hacked off his head. Edward was devastated. But amidst his grief, he managed to retain some sense of control over events. He decided that an invasion of Scotland would restore his damaged prestige. And more importantly, allow him to go after his lover's murderers. So Edward marched north against the Scots. His plan was to cover himself in glory by bringing down Robert the Bruce. If only he could do that, he could unite his wavering supporters as well as persuade some of his less certain, less vigorous opponents to all unite behind his newly victorious banners. And that would have the added advantage of fatally isolating his overmighty subjects who'd remained behind in England. If only he could have hung around for 600 years, Robert Burns could have given his warning that the best laid plans of mice and men oft gang aglie. On the banks of the Bannock Burn, Edward's best laid plans went disastrously, atrociously awry. Edward, in a display of military ineptitude that would have earned him a place at the map table of any chateau-based First World War headquarters, took the advice of his military advisers, and I use that phrase in its loosest possible sense. They attacked an army, a ramshackle army of Scotsmen, only a third of their size. And as a result, they suffered the most horrendous and catastrophic defeat. A defeat that the jocks still laugh about to this day. But the English found precious little to make them laugh. The flower of England were comprehensively annihilated by a ragbag army of Scotsmen. A rabble who inflicted the greatest ever defeat that was suffered by English chivalry the remnant that scuttled back to the border, cursed the day they'd ever followed Edward II and wished to God that his father had still been alive. The banner of Scottish independence briefly fluttered free at Bannockburn. It clothed Robert the Bruce in the cloak of heroic kingship. But for Edward, well, his cataclysmic defeat stripped him of his last threadbare shreds of kingly dignity. His authority was disastrously weakened, and to all intents and purposes, he was now a puppet in the hands of his enemies. What happened was that the new regime, which went on for a few years, um, Edward wasn't allowed, to, he was allowed to sort of wear crowns and go out and hunt and, and, and be seen in front of all his people, but he wasn't allowed any proper jobs like organising the money or the finances, and he wasn't allowed to appoint anyone. But after a while, he, he started looking around for a new boyfriend, and he discovered a, a chap, a, a, a very close friend, called Hugh Dispenser, which is a very odd name. Now, Hugh Dispenser had a son whose name was Hugh Dispenser, and they did a lot of that in those days, and he really fancied the younger son. But this, really, this was the final straw for his wife. 
and she decided she was off home. She was going back to dad. So she took their son. They'd had a son by this time. Miraculously, they'd had a son by this time. And she took the son back to France. And poor, um, well, it wasn't really, he didn't give a damn, Edward, but the nobles wanted them back. So they asked for her to come back, but she refused. Isabella's loathing of her husband drove her to seek refuge at her father's court in Paris, a humiliation in itself, but as nothing compared to what she'd suffered back in England. She was a French princess of the blood, a king's pawn in the royal game, but she was also a woman. Now, this really uh, hacked off the British barons. I don't think young Edward was too bothered one way or the other. I mean, he, he had what he wanted back in England. But uh, anyway, he, the, the people were sent out to try and bring her back, but she wouldn't come back. But there was a very good reason that she wouldn't come back, because she'd met someone. She'd met one of the British nobles that had gone out when uh, Edward took the country back, a guy called Roger Mortimer, who was a baron. And together they uh, set up home in France, but they decided that, uh, because there was such support for them, both in England and in France, that they would come back and try and uh, get the crown back for them, for, the, for her son. The rising tide of widespread discontent was lapping at the edges of Edward's rule. When Isabella and Mortimer landed at Weymouth, there was a massive groundswell of support for them. Followers flocked to their standards and their march on London began to resemble a triumphal procession. Their invasion was very successful and they got straight to it. They realized the first person they should get at was to, was to get to um, Hugh, poor young Hugh Dispenser and they did in a big way. They, uh, it was the cruelest cut of all. They had him castrated, wedding tackle removed and then had him cut in, they were hung, drawn and quartered and quartering was a way of going four ways at once. It was horrible. But the, the most important thing was to remove her husband from the view of any supporters he might have. So they kept trailing him around castles as a prisoner, and he ended up in Barclay Castle, down a well, strange enough. They kept him in a well. Whilst his family deliberated his discreet disposal, Edward was already a dead man. But the king was a man deeply loyal to his friends, and now a band of those friends repaid that loyalty Breaking him out of Berkeley, they rode furiously for the Isle of Purbeck and a ship to France. But at Corfe Castle, Edward, like another Edward long before, was overtaken by his enemies. They took him back to Berkeley Castle and the degrading death that awaited him there. Edward was a tall, muscular man, and killing him wasn't easy. The jailers took a heavy oak tabletop and attempted to crush the life out of the king. When Edward fought back and threw them off, they decided on a course that has few equals for sheer depraved barbarity. The struggling king would have been spread-eagled, held fast at wrist and ankle, and pinned down across his waist, and a hollowed-out horn would have been pushed up into his bowel. Then they heated a poker until the metal tip glowed white hot. The poker was now carefully placed into the horn and eased slowly, smoothly and searingly upward through his bowels, spilling its contents into his belly and most importantly, leaving no sign or mark as to how the king had died. Well, it certainly be effective and end up in a horrible death. For a start, if you push a red hot poker up into the anus through a funnel, it's not going to cause any external burns and it's go right up into the rectum and burn a hole through the rectal wall. And that will cause the rectal contents to spill into the peritoneal cavity and set up a horrible infection, peritonitis. And that will kill you in about two days' time. And it's a horrible, painful death. I wouldn't think it would be an in instantaneous death. It would be fairly slow. Uh, for a start, perforation of the bowel doesn't kill you outright. It takes some time for the infection to set in and peritonitis to set, peritonitis to set in. And that's what kills you, so it takes a couple of days. Well, certainly it would have uh, achieved what they wanted to. That's not leave any external mark. There won't be anything visible externally. As Edward II was having his life scorched from his brutalized body, his son was being crowned Edward III with great pomp and ritual ceremony amidst the splendors of Westminster Abbey. <laughs> 
Shortly afterwards, his father's corpse was laid to rest with no less splendour in his beautiful tomb at Gloucester Cathedral. But his son, visiting the grave frequently, never forgot his father, and he never forgot the man who'd engineered his murder. In time, he plotted a coup against the combined strength of his mother and his stepfather's government. And having seized power, he had Mortimer arraigned with a whole raft of atrocious crimes, most of which he was clearly guilty of. And so revenge was had on the headsman's block. And mum, well, Edward forgave her and put her away under house arrest in the quiet seclusion of Rising Castle in Norfolk. King Edward II was murdered by his wife and her lover, and most of the nobility connived in the act, happy to be rid of a monarch who had little or no kingly dignity and far too many favourites. I'm sure some of you will think I'm beginning to lose it, but, you know, in my experience, there is just a handful of places where the stones seem to hold on to the sounds of the past. If you go to Barclay Castle and you look into the king's prison cell, you'll hear the sounds there. The feral grunts of the jailers, the screaming shrieks of the king in his final obscene agony. Whatever you think Edward II's failings were as a king, you can't look away from the fact that Edward was also a man and no man deserves such a deplorable and degrading death as Edward II. The border between England and Scotland has got to be one of the most beautiful places in the whole of Britain. A place of green, gently swollen hills and softly spoken voices. But for hundreds of years, that land was a blood-spattered wilderness. A place across which no man could travel in safety unless he went armed to the teeth and in the companionship of friends. A place of blood feud and constant debilitating fear, and occasional searing 
flaring terror. It was a place where neither man nor woman nor child could ever sleep wholly safe in their beds at night. If Jesus Christ were amongst them, they'd deceive him. So said an appalled traveller and the Anglo-Scottish border families, a less than glowing description of the rustlers, raiders, outlaws, broken men and moss troopers who dwelt in the narrow lands either side of the frontier between England and Scotland. Men whose lives revolved around terror and thieving, bloody mayhem and family feud. The everyday story of country folk. That was the blood-splashed life of a border reaver. The word reaver means robber or raider. They were sort of land pirates and gangs of reavers held sway in these borderlands for more than three centuries. Uh, they robbed, they raided cattle, they burnt and looted houses, and often when they were at feud, they murdered each other. Hence the word bereaved comes from the word reaver. They rode out across this hauntingly lovely landscape and turned it into Bosnia or Chechnya. Violence was not the lay motif of life along the border. It was the recurring dominant theme. Each family lived and survived, flourished or failed at the expense of another. Murder and mayhem, arson, ambush, kidnapping and extortion. They even gave us the word blackmail the description of their own little protection racket. Now, don't for a minute go thinking that there was anything vaguely romantic or Robin Hoodsy about these characters. There wasn't. Chivalry meant absolutely nothing to them. If Reavers rode a raid against you, all that you could expect would be that they would be straightforward and businesslike in their application to the task in hand. They made no exceptions to anybody in any circumstance. That's how a poor widow like Isabel Routledge, with just a handful of cattle between her and destitution, could find herself in the grey dawn, stripped of everything she owned, with just the bare thatch up above her. But she did better than Anne Hetherington when the same Elliot gang visited her two nights later. They burnt her house down around her ears, took all her stock and left her in the cold grey dawn to put her husband and his servant into a dark, dank grave. And both of them were as nothing compared to what happened to Hecky Noble. Hecky Noble who saw 200 head of cattle driven away from the village nine houses in that village raised to the ground and had to stand and listen to the screams of her son and his daughter-in-law, his pregnant daughter-in-law, as they were burnt alive in their home. Care and compassion didn't feature large on the Reaver's itinerary. By the 1500s, the borderers had long since ceased to seek the protection of their monarchs. They no longer looked to them for justice. They were matters they dealt with themselves. And they no longer gave their loyalty to anyone except their family. Unless, of course, someone paid very handsomely to secure their services, to hire their freelancers. And that's where we get that word from, too but real loyalty was about blood, a bond strengthened by ancient, deep-seated bitterness between certain of the 70 or so families who for hundreds of years made the border a waking nightmare. <laughs> 
it was quite often clan against clan, and, and then there'd be groups of families within the clan. So the, the Armstrongs and the Elliots would ride together, for example. Uh, but then there would be ancient feuds, for example, the Maxwells and the Johnsons, uh, the, the feud between those two families went, uh, ran, ran and ran. Um, but a, a family like the Armstrongs had, uh, were represented in both countries, so, um, and they would tend to support go with the flow, really. They would support the, uh, sometimes the dominant uh, um, country position, uh, sometimes the other way around. Uh, and then you had this situation where uh, people from the same family would be fighting in battles, for example, Flodden, where uh, cousins would be fighting on opposite sides. Throughout the debatable lands along the border, no man in his right mind went anywhere unarmed. The land was dominated by the lance and pistol, by the sword and shield, and the shaggy, sturdy ponies that men rode when they set out on moonlit raids, set out on those nights when the steel bonnets shook loose the border. But amidst all the reeking chaos of the borders, it was the blood feud that was its worst nightmare. Not just the taking of a murderer's life in revenge for the life of his victim. Oh no, this was vendetta, pure and simple. The taking of any man's life who shared the surname of the murdering clan. It was a vicious, bloody downward spiral into murder and mayhem. Some of the most appalling slayings, some of the most atrocious murders in the whole of border history can be laid at the door of blood feud. But the worst of all was the one between the Johnstons and the Maxwells. These powerful families clung to each other with the angry, determined desperation of drowning men. As they dragged each other down, hundreds more were sucked into the maelstrom and whirled away. To this day, nobody can be certain how the feud began, but throughout much of the 1500s, both clans clashed head on at every opportunity. Each side of the border was divided into three marches and each had a warden responsible for trying to keep the peace. The Johnstons and the Maxwells merely turned their successive wardenships of the Scots West March into a personal battleground. In 1585, with the warden at Johnston, the Maxwells, backed by Grahams and Armstrongs, launched an all-out campaign to seize control of the entire West March. And once again, the border went up in flames. The Johnstons struck back, burning and looting Maxwell villages. The Maxwells struck back again burning and looting Johnston villages. They hung four Johnstons from the doors of their own houses. And in a great raid which swept through Johnston lands, they killed over 300 Johnstons and reaved 3,000 head of cattle. This was one of the bloodiest brawls in border history. And it was the last of the great borderer battles. But the feud that forced it never quite disappeared forever. The ripples ran outwards for many years until they touched the lives of two descendants and led to events that finally ended the story forever. Willie Johnston of Kirk Hill reaved a black horse from Willie Carmichael at Gretna, a regular enough reaving incident. However, Willie Carmichael was related to John Carmichael, who was then the March Warden, and he insisted that Willie Johnston return the horse. This he did. But Willie Johnson, now finding himself without a mount, looked for another, and he stole one from the Crichtons. The Crichtons and the Johnstons skirmished. They had a mini feud. And during the period of that, a new March Warden was appointed, a Maxwell. And he was under pressure to put a stop to the Johnstons' activities. So he marched with force, with 2,000 men, he marched on Lockwood Castle. Maxwell offered 10 pounds in land to any man who would bring him a Johnston head or hand. The Johnstons, being less wealthy, 
offered five pounds for any man who would bring similar portions of a Maxwell. As the Maxwell forces marched on Lockwood on December the 6th, 1593, they were ambushed on dry sands by the Johnstons. The Johnstons could only field 400 men, 400 against 2,000. But the Johnstons knew they were fighting for their very existence and they fought desperately. Maxwell's disordered men were cut to pieces. John Maxwell was knocked from his horse, it is said by James Johnston himself. Maxwell then raised a hand in surrender, looking for mercy. It was cut off. Maxwell was then hacked to death. It was an incredible victory for the Johnstons with their inferior numbers. And a measure of how desperate they were that day is that one of their riders was young Robert Johnston, aged 11. In 1608, a meeting was contrived to effect a lasting reconciliation between the two families. James Johnston met the new clan chief of the Maxwells. They shook hands. As James Johnston turned away, Lord Maxwell shot him in the back. The history of the border reavers is soaked and stained with blood. But it's a history that didn't end as you might have expected, or even as they might have expected, in a flurry of blows on some snow-swept hillside. It actually ended when an unprepossessing little Scottish king gleefully ascended the English throne. Because James VI of Scotland and James I of England united both crowns under one man. And by doing that, he took away forever the need that both countries had had to have a stout bulwark between them. They no longer needed to shake loose the border in order to feel safe one from the other. So although the moon still rises huge above the Solway Moss and up above the debatable lands, for nearly 300 years, the silhouettes of Moss troopers haven't passed across the face of that moon and the hills haven't flared to the fitful light of burning houses, light that cast their girish glow on some good wife sitting cradling the head of her dying husband as he lay in a puddle of his own spilt blood.